Peter Malinowskis, welcome to the program. In March, you said that primary health care in this country was collapsing. Is $2.2 billion in federal funding enough to fix that? Well, thanks for having us, Laura. Look, the short answer to that question is no, but it is certainly welcome. Uh, I'm very grateful for the, for the fact, as I think most state premiers are, that the Prime Minister and the new federal government is serious about doing something about the GP crisis that we see across the country. Uh, $2.2 billion will make a difference. Um, there are practical measures that the Commonwealth is taking as part of that we, that I welcome. Uh, but the truth is we are going to see, need to see a lot more effort than that if we're going to address what really is a, a cratering of primary health care and accessibility to GPs around the country. Well, can you quantify how much more needs to be done in that primary health care sector to fix those problems? Well, I mean, Deloitte Access Economics is telling us that, you know, there is going to be a, a shortage of approximately 11,000 FTE GPs uh, by the end of this decade. Now, that's a very substantial number. Uh, we don't see anything like that number coming into the system anytime soon. So just on workforce development alone, there has to be serious work done. But just to provide a bit of context for your viewers, Laura, uh, what we're seeing in South Australia, which I understand is being replicated around the country, is just not more people coming in to our emergency departments in hospitals, but the fact that people are coming in a lot sicker. Uh, people who, are, who have rolled up at our emergency departments over the last 12 months uh, who we get categorised as Category 2, which means they've got to be seen within 10 minutes, has exploded by 60%, whereas the low category uh, acuity has, be, has been reduced by 20 to 25%. So it's not just more people rolling up to our emergency departments, they're rolling up sicker, Laura, and that speaks to people not getting access to a GP when they need it most. Uh, well, looking at the announcements from Friday's meeting, um, it seems on all of the issues that you discussed, whether it's Medicare, the NDIS or housing, there hasn't actually been any movement on the underlying funding agreements between the Commonwealth and the states since the Albanese government came to office. Are you concerned that the federal government is on a bit of a go slow on some of these issues because of its budgetary problems? Well, clearly the Commonwealth, as is the case with most state governments around the country, with maybe the exception of Western Australia, uh, is under fiscal strain and they've got to make decisions and um, are held to account for the, their fiscal policy as is prudent. But um, I don't think the federal government's on a go slow. I think the Prime Minister has uh, made it clear repeatedly at National Cabinet and outside afterwards that he accepts the number one priority of National Cabinet is seeing reform to our primary health care system so we can see a better delivery of services within our hospital system around the nation. And I think when the Prime Minister says this is a number one priority, we expect to see action that follows. And a $2 billion commitment is a pretty good start, notwithstanding the fact that clearly there needs to be more movement if we're going to address this crisis in a way I think most Australians now understand needs to happen, because this isn't just statistical anymore. This is uh, what Australians are living out on a daily basis, and they hear about it anecdotally uh, when they talk to loved ones as well. Well, the states were saying 12 months ago that uh, the need to have more funding uh, in hospitals was urgent, um, that you needed to get the federal government to lift its funding from 45% to 50% and to abolish the 6.5% annual growth cap in, in hospital funding. Uh, when does that need to happen? I mean, there's a review going on at the moment, but you know, there's, there's a sense that we may not see any progress on this until next year now. Look, the National Health Funding Agreement between the Commonwealth and the states will be negotiated in due course. But to speak plainly, Laura, I don't think Australians are sitting around too concerned about the fact that uh, the Commonwealth picks up 45% of what happens in our, emergency, in our hospitals versus the state's 55 I think what they care about is whether or not they're getting looked after in a timely manner. And the fact is that if people don't get to see a GP and they end up rolling up at a hospital a lot sicker where it's far more expensive to treat them, not only does that represent a worse outcome for the patient, it actually means the Commonwealth is paying for 45% of failure when someone rolls up at an emergency department sicker than what they should be. So it's not, I don't think, really about just focusing on the funding split between states and the feds. It's actually about delivering better outcomes for patients. If we focus on that, Laura, first and foremost, then the dollars will look after themselves. And that's where primary healthcare reform has an opportunity. The National Cabinet has agreed that we're going to have a special purpose National Cabinet in the last quarter of this year. 
Uh, we think that is timely. It gives us time between now and then to actually start to aerate some of the opportunities for substantial reform, not just focused on funding splits, that could actually make a difference and we'll look forward to that meeting in a few months' time. Well, on the NDIS, the states and territories have agreed to slow down the scheme's growth rate to 8% within three years. What does that actually mean the states will have to do to help achieve that goal? Well, already the states are making substantial contributions. I note there's been some con um, commentary around the place, Laura, that, that suggests that uh, the states have relinquished their responsibilities in respect to disability services. I reject that. Um, in South Australia alone, in this current financial year, we're contributing over $840 million to the NDIA for the purposes of services within provided by the NDIS. Now, that's a lot of money for a budget of the size of South Australia. So, um, but we do accept, and the Prime Minister made this clear, and, and we certainly see the rationale, that we can't see a continuous explosion in the growth at a, you know, an unacceptable rate of the cost of the NDIS. Um, that actually undermines the viability of the NDIS, which in turn could have an impact on the people that it seeks to care for. Um, that's not sustainable, and I do think that state governments have to be willing to work cooperatively with the Commonwealth to see a curtailment on, in the growth that would actually see the NDIS becoming far more expensive um, than Medicare itself. That was never envisaged, and I do think we've got to work together on this endeavour, and that's something that the states have agreed to um, do with the Prime Minister. Well, just finally, uh, you mentioned that Western Australia was in a better position than a lot of other people. That's because of a GST deal, <laughs> which is now revealed to be costing $25 billion to the federal government and effectively the other states. What would you like to see and when would you like to see it uh, happen uh, to get a, a better deal for South Australia on the GST? Well, it's not just South Australia. I think there's other state governments around the country, including New South Wales and Victoria, that have been shortchanged as a result of the deal that the Morrison uh, government left us with um, as a state uh, and as a country. Um, currently, state governments enjoy a top-up, so they are not shortchanged. Um, that expires in a couple of years' time and will rep represent a very substantial hit to state budgets around the country. Now, we don't have to address this problem only by taking money away from Western Australia. There is the option available to the Commonwealth to see the retention of the top up that is currently locked in in the federal budget. That would see that no state is uh, left in a worse position. Um, and that would allow us, Laura, to continue our investments in health, housing and education, as, long as, as well as our efforts around decarbonisation, which my government is very firm about. Peter Malinowskis, thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Laura. Cheers.